ओम ज्ञान तिरंधस्य ज्ञानाजन शलाकाय चक्षुरोन्मल तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नमा ओं विष्णुपदा कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम रामा हरे 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 कृष्णा सो आई एम ग्रेटफुल टू बी हियर विद ऑल ऑफ यू टुडे एंड हियर वी आर डिस्कसिंग द टेंथ कैंटो ऑफ द श्रीमद भागवतम वेर इन द फोकस इज ऑन द बैक स्टोरी बिफोर कृष्णाज अपियरेंस the 10th canto has 90 chapters and almost all of them are centered on krishna on the life of krishna along with some of some of the places where he also gives his teachings so today's session i'll discuss in three parts first is we'll discuss about a quick over, overview of these few verses which we read just now then second i'll talk about the system of dowry and the third we'll uh, we'll talk about how more important than than implementing rule is inspiring values or virtues hmm. so firstly the 10th canto begins with parikshit maharaj asking about the life and teaching life of krishna in greater detail in the previous canto in the ninth canto toward the end in summary that the teachings have been krishna's life was described very briefly just as lord ram's life was described briefly and he desires parishad maharaj desires to hear it in much more detail and in that connection he uh, asks questions and these are the answers so recognizing that parikshit maharaj has vistarad he wants to hear in detail about krishna that is because among all the manifestations of divinity among the various avatars of the lord parikshit maharaj is most intimately connected with krishna for multiple reasons krishna is the, the you could say the latest avatar who had appeared just a few just a, a generation or two ago secondly his family was intimately related with krishna his grandfather was arjuna was the foremost friend of krishna and thirdly because parishit maharaj was naturally also personally attracted to krishna so because of this when he starts describing about krishna he starts with a back story about krishna and as this back story is being described shri prabhupad if you see he has given commentary till the 14th chapter and even in the 10th canto shri prabhupad's focus is not only on the transcendental he focuses on the social as the way to the transcendental among the various acharyas in our tradition shri prabhupad is the first acharya who has combined social commentary with spiritual commentary or scriptural commentary you can say that means if you look at the commentaries of vishwanath chakravarti thakur on the bhagavatam or you look at the sandarbha com sandarbha explanations of yuga goswami now both of these were written at times of great social upheaval just uh, Vrindavan at that time was in a very geographically close to a, a place where there had been Islamic rule, 
and some of the rulers were extremely fanatical but vishwanath thakur nowhere in his bhagavatam commentary mentions anything about about oh how terrible society has become degraded today and these people are there and they are causing kara they are causing such problems in scriptural commentary he focuses on scriptural commentary vishla prabhupad but almost every commentary of prabhupad every purport of prabhupad addresses social issues now why is that there is both a historical reason and a transcendental reason the historical reason is that prabhupad is writing his books to an audience which is utterly unfamiliar with even the fundamentals of the spiritual culture and spiritual wisdom that the original audience of scripture were familiar with so because of that prabhupad has to start from basics so chakravarti pad if he is writing his commentary um, he doesn't have to explain the concept of dowry at all that was a part of the culture but prabhupad is writing a commentary where he is addressing audiences very different from the original audiences <clears throat> and that's why he needs to bring in historic he needs to address the two things the social dimensions of whatever is described in the scripture that means say prabhupad makes one statement over here dowry is not considered illegal now why does he mention illegal over there in the purport because in india dowry is presently considered illegal and prabhupad is saying a dowry therefore is never illegal according to the vedic system so prabhupad is addressing social issues even in scriptural commentary why because these issues need to be understood the historical reason is that these can become stumbling blocks for those who are not familiar with them and unless these are addressed they may not be able to focus on the essential principles and the transcendental reason is that shri prabhupad taught a spirituality that was which was very engaged spirituality engaged means prabhupad was not just interested in explaining scripture he was interested in helping people live according to scripture and live according to the essential teachings of scripture and that is why he gave social commentary so here i am talking about two distinct things that if this is scripture and this is the audience to which scripture was spoken and this is today's world so sometimes in scripture there may be certain things which today's audience may find objectionable question at least questionable so prabhupada has to explain it for today's audience at the same time what shri prabhupada is also doing is that he wants today's audience also to learn to live according to scripture now for that when they are in a completely different social setting what needs to be done for that purpose how can they live according to scripture so for that purpose also he has social commentary now it's interesting uh, prabhupada is very nuanced prabhupad is dowry is never illegal within the vedic system prabhupad is not making a political statement about today he is not saying that we should fight against the any laws that, that make dowry illegal and, and that we should make dowry illegal or we should make dowry essential no prabhupad what is he doing is he is explaining what is there in scripture in a way that it doesn't become a stumbling block for people to understand the essential message of scripture the essential message of scripture is ultimately remember krishna sarva vidhi nisheda asur etaye working karo smartavya satatam vishnu vismartavya na jatu chit always remember krishna never forget krishna so once we consider these two aspects of of scripture of uh, prabhupad's distinctive presentation of scripture what he what is he doing he is giving a social ex explanation of the social dimensions of scripture and he is addressing current so social issues so that people can apply scripture so with these two things in mind 
Now let's look at the concept of dowry as such. So in many ways, in today's world, there are a lot of things uh, which we can look from our perspective and we can say these, these, are, these are terrible. These are at least these are not good. At least if you consider in in India and several other countries, the dowry becomes. Prabhupada says it's a way of expressing affection, and there's a particular socio cultural system there. So in the past, inheritance would normally go over to the male progeny. So does that mean that the females would get nothing? The girls would get nothing? No. So dowry was the way uh, the women would get some of the father's uh, father's inheritance or father's property and it would be voluntarily and lovingly given but unfortunately over time what happens is rules they become uh, they become divorced from their essential purpose and that is what is called as niyamagraha now niyamagraha has two meanings one is that insisting on the letter of the law without understanding the spirit of the law or the other is uh, rejecting the law entirely without even considering that its spirit might be good so both these happen somebody may say oh if we have to follow scripture then we have to follow scripture means Krishna says, Arjuna says, Sarva manye. I accept everything that you say, Krishna. Therefore, if we are going to follow scripture, we have to re we have to reapply, reimpose the dowry system in today's world. Well, no. Sarvam etadritam manye. If I accept everything that you say, when Krishna, Arjuna tells Krishna after Chatush Loki Gita, what he is meaning is that when Krishna makes that claim, which can seem a very presumptuous claim that I am not known by even by the devtas. That Krishna says, my position is so sublime, so supreme, that even the devtas don't know me. And Krishna explains his supreme position. And this statement about your position, about the supremacy of your position and the supremacy of devotion to you, that is what I accept. I have no reservation of Krishna in accepting your supreme position. So, in scripture, there are some, there is something which is called as prescriptive. So, descriptive means it is describing the way things were at that time. And prescriptive means these are what we need to do at this time. So understanding this difference is important. Descriptive is this is how it was done at that time. Hmm? This is what you need to do or we need to do. So for example, when it is described that during Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's time, the the Jagannath temple management did not allow Haridas Thakur to enter into the temple. So is that something which is descriptive or prescriptive? It is descriptive. It is what it was the custom at that time. It is not something which has to be implemented and certainly not imposed today. So there are many things which are descriptive, but not necessarily prescriptive. There are descriptions of elaborate yagyas. Maharaj Yudhishthira is a pure devotee. But he expends so much effort in performing a Rajasuya Yagya. Today, do we have to do Rajasuya Yagya? Certainly not. No matter how wealthy a person is, they don't have to. So we can have both. So some both Jagannath temple entry rules. You may say that is descriptive. But even something done by devotees, Raja Suya Yagya, done by a person like Yudhishthira Maharaj, even that is a part of the descriptive nature of scripture. It is not prescriptive. So prescriptive is what? Today it is Harinam Sankirtan. Sankirtan Yagya is there. 
chanting of the holy names is there so for example even in the gita if you consider 1866 is a descript is a prescriptive rule that sarva dharma an pratyaj maam ekam sharanam vraja whereas when krishna says that on that now i am going to show you the universal form with heads spread all over hands spread all over that is descriptive that is not prescriptive so there is a descriptive side and a prescriptive side now bhakti nath thakur explains that if we get too caught in the descriptive side he says we all need to be saragrahi so saragrahi means we can say in this term don't let the descriptive distract us from the prescriptive if we let ourselves get distracted then that is a problem we can we we have to recognize what is our prior priority we will end up unnecessarily making things complicated for us and for others so essence what is essence a saragrahi is essence seeker and the essence seeker is one who focuses on what is the essence so the prescriptive part is the essence now how exactly something is prescribed and applied that all has to be understood carefully but so focus on the prescriptive so prabhupad himself if you see his stone over here now that's the point i'm emphasizing that prabhupad is in no way saying that this is inherit the property of her father and therefore an affection father even the marriage of his daughter would give her as much as possible so he is describing a daughter would he is not saying a daughter should would is describing what happened at that time similarly a dowry is therefore is never illegal according to the vedic system and then he goes on and further describes it is never illegal according to the vedic system it's a description of the vedic system and these long standing these are old customs in the society of varanashram dharma which is now wrongly designated as hindu these long set turning customs are nicely described here so upad is explaining or so there were in every society for the smooth organization of society there are certain rules and those rules are important for the purpose of organizing if we get if we don't understand that purpose then what happens is then then we get caught in non essentials so rules and purpose now rules can be variable and variable means what that uh, rules can be, so it's described in the mahabharat that when bhishma sought the hand of the princess of Ma, princess madri for pandu he went to her brother shalya and shalya said that in our family the tradition is that whenever a marriage happens uh, it is the boy's side that gives gifts to the girl's side and that is in in today's parlance it is in english it is called as bride prize and bhishma says i am aware of this and that's why i have brought lavish gifts and he brought uh, card loads of gifts for madri's family and so bhishma so shalya is satisfied and of course shalya also gives gifts back when when their marriage happens and then they go back so the point is even within the vedic tradition there was diversity that how society is to be administered that is something which is which is a matter of ensuring that people society so that people can function harmoniously how exactly this harmoniousness will happen that will vary from person to person okay is my audio unclear or video unclear in between it is breaking like when you shift from slides to screen and screen uh, uh, screen sharing to slides so 
Sometimes. Okay, is it better now? If it, if it happens again, please let me know. Okay. So the rules can vary, and the rules don't themselves have to be implemented at all times. In one sense, we can say in today's world, there is often an emphasis that you know, all these rules are old-fashioned and they should be rejected. And not only they should be rejected, they are oppressive and they are discriminatory. Well, okay, that from today's perspective, in today's society, certain rules may have become implemented in a way that is discriminatory. The intent was not discriminatory. The, as Prabhupada says, uh, he in this case, rules, uh, rule, the purpose was an expression of affection. <clears throat> that the, the dowry or bride price, both were expressions of affection. And in the context, if the inheritance laws were such that women would not inherit, then in that case, dowry was as a way of the of financial security for the bride. Now, if you look at the Dharma Shastras, within Dharma Shastras, it is for the Dharma Shastras are Manusmuti is just one, but there are many Dharma Shastras. And within the Dharma Shastras, it is described that actually what, what is the system of dowry? The dowry was considered property of the bride, not of the bride's family. What does that mean? That generally it was in the form of some kind of jewelry and other thing. So especially the jewelry part, not all of it, but the idea was this, this dowry would be passed on by the bride to her daughter. So that's how it was like a system of female inheritance to her daughter at her wedding. At her refers to the daughter's wedding. So that was the system originally. So normal inheritance would happen through the property. But these kind of gifts, especially personal possessions, they're passed on. And generally, the dowry would be, the, as I said, the woman's property, even the husband or the husband's family, they would not claim it. They would not claim right on it. They, it would be her property in family emergencies. She may choose to use it. The family may decide that you know, this is what we need to use. But the system was, it is the way in which a woman would have security. And then that would be passed on. Unfortunately, of course, the system has become degenerated and it has become degenerated in such a way that dowry sometimes becomes, uh, becomes a demand in today's world. And then when it becomes a demand and that demand is not fulfilled, there is exploitation, there is abuse, there is violence and that is horrendous. So in today's world, the way it has been misused is unfortunate and it is not that this system has to be reinvented in today's world. So um, that is the second part. The third part, which I'll conclude is that ultimately there are two things. There are rules and there are values. So actually rules are meant to foster values not replace values. What does it mean? That any form of rules that we have, uh, they are meant to help people act according to certain good moral and spiritual values. So what is the moral and spiritual value over here? If there is a system of dowry, that is when the, when the wedding is happening, at that time, a way in which gifts are given is through dowry. So it is meant to foster values. But any kind of rule we may have, if we insist on the rule without considering the under, underlying value over a period of time, what will happen is the rule will start getting misused. The rule will start getting uh, not only misused unnecessary or unconsciously, but sometimes consciously and uh, malevolently it can get misused. So if we consider, for example, traffic rules. Mm -hmm. Now, the purpose of traffic rules is to ensure that there is smooth traffic on the road. So there could be some people, say, for example, somebody who's an ambulance driver. 
Now for them, the rules are lifted. So that, oh, okay, you, an ambulance can go through even the red signal. Traffic rules with exception for, now in one sense, uh, exception for ambulances. But now, if the ambulance driver doesn't have the basic values of how to drive properly on a road, then they, they may be wanting to save a life of the person who is in the car, in the ambulance, but in that process, they may drive recklessly and they may endanger or even take away the life of somebody else who is on the road. So just because a person is driving an ambulance and they have some level of exceptions, doesn't mean that they can be reckless. And even somebody who is an exception, the purpose of the exception is what? Okay, we want smooth traffic so that people can reach safely their destinations. But that safety, if somebody's life is in danger, the normal rules can be suspended. Traffic rules can vary from place to place, from circumstance to circumstance. So now, <clears throat> as, a, as a society, somehow, we have moved in a direction where values are de-emphasized and rules are emphasized. And what happens when values are de-emphasized and rules are emphasized? Then the debate shifts from the from the underlying value to the merit of the rules. So um, I don't want to get into a current polypolitical surcharge topic on any specific side, but the principle I want to illustrate. Say now with the COVID pandemic seeming to go on and on and on for a long time. There are some people who feel that we should have mask mandates, that nobody should be allowed to go out without a mask. Nobody should be allowed to travel without a vaccine. And there are others are saying, no, no, you cannot, the government cannot impose rules like this. So irrespective, the point is that are the rules meant to aid in personal responsibility or are they replacing a sense of personal responsibility? That means, do we consider that people are irresponsible and that's why we need rules? Well, if people are irresponsible, no amount of rules are going to work. So if you consider rules and responsibility, rules without personal responsibility are never, won't work. So for example, now, as we become a more and more, say, um, rule-centered society. Now, there is one of my friends is working uh, in one of the top car manufacturing companies. And they say that in America, they made a rule that all future cars should have an indicator which will turn on if a baby is alone in the car. That if a, fam if a baby in the baby seat has been left alone in the car, then immediately that indicator will turn on and it will alert. It will start ringing, it will alert the local police, local, alert the local authorities. So now, if we consider, if a set of parents or a set of guardians are irresponsible enough to leave a baby inside the car all alone, then is simply the ringing of an alarm going to alert them? Is it going to check them? Is it something which is a matter of you know, common sense, a common parental sense of responsibility is required? Without that, to what extent can we have rules? How far can we legislate basic values? This is a key point that values can't ultimately be legislated. They need to be inspired. You can, there are certain, they need to be inspired. They need, we need to inspire values. We can't legis legislation. How far it, can it go on? Now, yes, there are some parents who unfortunately will be irresponsible. But to take care of those exceptions, is it worth it that all future buyers of cars have to pay extra to have that particular device installed in the cars? If we go forward, how much further can we go? To what extent will we decide that we'll respect, uh, we'll replace values with rules? So, it, it just, so we may find that oh, in the past the rules were oppressive, the rules are to be rejected. 
but today we have a similar kind of rules of a uh, we have similar excess of rules but of a different kind of a different kind so the idea is prabhupad started the international society for krishna consciousness that we ultimately want to raise consciousness as consciousness is raised the appropriate values naturally become manifested the appropriate values naturally become manifested so this is where sattva guna rajoguna tamoguna comes in that that unless a person is rising in their consciousness <coughs> they will not value values so they will not value the values and they will not value the rules that are meant to foster the values so yes that this doesn't mean that no rules are required rules are of course necessary in society but rules alone are never enough it is rules have to be sustained by complemented by values and when we study scripture you know we need to focus on the values within scripture what are the values being taught over here and the ultimate value is the devotional value of remembrance of krishna of service to krishna or sacrifice for krishna's cause if we focus on those values then what rules in today's world will foster those values will become gradually clearer but if we neglect the essential values and the result will be that we will simply get distort we get distracted so so we need to go beyond beyond rules to value the beyond doesn't mean we neglect rules we focus on the uh, principle okay what is the value what is the principle what is the virtue that is being taught over here and when we focus on that so begin with values when we are trying to when people study scripture um, when somebody studies uh, says scripture in today's world and they say, oh you know this this doesn't make sense to me this doesn't make sense to me this doesn't make sense to me but i find this not acceptable okay or you find something uh, there could be some prabhupada statements about women about certain about certain groups of people about certain societies which we find somewhat uh, somewhat questionable but instead of getting caught in the statements what is the value being taught over there so you begin with values then understand what rules today will foster those values will foster those values so this is a extremely important principle to learn and prabhupada himself was very pragmatic with respect to this what do i mean by pragmatic that prabhupada for when he engaged devotees in serving krishna the value was engage everyone in serving krishna so even when people were from their life members in india they were not interested in chanting 16 rounds at all so there are hundreds and hundreds of pages of shila prabhupada's conversation with life members and there's practically not even one reference where prabhupada is asking them how many rounds are you chanting how many rounds is your family chanting are you chanting 16 rounds prabhupad is not doing that at all prabhupad focuses on what he is engaging them in service engaging them in service and they served in they assisted in many different ways they helped in in uh, in building temples they helped in establishing contacts and they rendered service so we can say even when prabhupad was in india shila prabhupad's dealings with life members should a focus on values not on rules now we are here we are talking about rules which prabhupad himself introduced in one sense the 16 round chanting and these things but prabhupad didn't over emphasize them when people are engaged in the service of krishna they will move forward it's interesting in the seven purposes of iskon i'll conclude this point prabhupad does not mention a single rule prabhupad does not mention the four regulatory principles prabhupad does not even mention chanting a certain number of rounds and prabhupad doesn't mention initiation we as a movement often consider or at least i started considering the success of our movement is how many people become initiated but prabhupad in the purpose of his con does not focus on that prabhupad says the purpose of his con is to correct the imbalance of values in society today and now exactly how those values will be will be will be adjusted will be corrected and how they will be implemented that will vary from person to person from situation to situation and shila prabhupada has given the example of expertly ensuring 
that the values are cultivated and the appropriate rules for cultivating those values are 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 implemented in a way that people are drawn toward krishna not alienated away from krishna so i'll summarize i discuss three main points today first was that i talked about in this context shila prabhupad is um, even in the 10th canto he is the first acharya to have integrated scriptural commentary with, with social commentary why because there is a social context in scripture which needs to be explained and secondly prabhupad wants essential scriptural teachings to be applied in today's social context also so within scripture there is descriptive and prescriptive and prabhupad with respect to the dowry is focusing on the descriptive part this is how it was this is why it was He's not saying this is how it should be now and second part i discussed is that how we need to <clears throat> recognize focus on the values <clears throat> what are the values being fostered over here and once we understand those values so i talked about dowry the principle was a way of expressing affection in a socio cultural context where where the women didn't get inheritance they got inheritance in some other way through dowry and it was it, and even that system was variable there was bride price elsewhere and that's also described in the mahabharata and accepted by an acharya like bhishma so <clears throat> we don't go to the either extreme of niyamagraha and the insisting on the letter of the law or reject uh, rejecting both the letter and the spirit of the law we understand the underlying values that are to be fostered and then we see following prabhupada's example how those values could be fostered cultivated in today's world while we may reject traditional values traditional rules as regressive or repressive but we may be in today's world going towards an excess of rules in some other direction so if we focus only on rules without inspiring values no rule will protect ultimately rules will be exploited and they'll be rejected so prabhupada started the international society for krishna consciousness as our consciousness rises values naturally become important for us and the rules that will help us foster those values we naturally follow them thank you very much hare krishna is there any is there quick question thank you henry mataji for your comment thank you susan mataji also yes okay henry mataji you have a question yeah i was uh, i was just uh... trying to invite uh, devotees to ask questions even though we only have 1 minute let's see if we can Oh speak. really okay yeah. we've heard this can you hear me okay prabhu okay. right. yes prabhu please go ahead yeah. so um <clears throat> making a very important point about you can do so many things <clears throat> but then why do you do it and we recorded this so many times as a, as a statement in scripture in the bible about even if you can convert the multitude even if you can speak with the tongues of men and angels even if you can raise the dead or heal the sick if it's done without love it's useless so we want to do things to please krishna and um if that's there even if the rules aren't followed exactly but if somebody's doing their humble best krishna's pleased that's our criteria thanks to dear hari toshan on the krishna's please then it, it everything makes sense otherwise how many rules you can follow like you mentioned about prabhat's um goals for iskon it's not mentioning the rules but he the goal is to become close to krishna pleasing krishna and to come close to each other and we've been trying to uh, generate this interactive class trying to stop it about a quarter to 8 so that we can hear the voices of the devotees and um but thank you very much a very wonderful class very erudite and we see your sincerity and how much effort you put into making us presentation of glorious and proper happy krishna thank you we're happy to be of service there's something from emily in the chat she's a question okay can you see it and what happens when uh the rules imposed to us have no value or go against our values yeah i think that's the situation of conflict where we may need to go deeper and see if those values 
if it's not if it's not helping us in our in if we, their value is not evident to us then we may have to inquire from those who know more to see what what are the purpose of these and uh, how the underlying values we may be able to pursue them in a slightly different way so it's a we don't have to go to the immediate extreme of rejecting the rules but try to understand try to understand from someone who who may be better were better aware of the underlying cultural context about what was the purpose of those particular rules what are the values and then see uh, how those values we can try to inculcate in our life okay thank you great gail followed by shikshash takamprabhu let's let's try to be brief dear to please hi krishna prabhu yes i wasn't able to make that connection between two statements that you made that the dowry is not illegal and you somehow you connected that to always remembering krishna okay the point i was making is that prabhupad is neither prabhupad is not insisting that dowry has to be implemented in today's world he's saying that yes this is how it was and is these are the customs of the varnashram dharma he is giving a more of a descriptive explanation of what was there but the essential principle he is not mandating that in all he is not saying that all those who are joining is con in all is con marriage there should be dowry no that's what i'm saying the essential principle is always remember krishna and that's why the society he started was for international society for krishna consciousness so i was giving the example as illustrating the difference between descriptive and prescriptive okay, okay. and would you say that uh, the, a de a basic definition for values is just what one considers important in one's life okay values this is a big big, big subject in itself so ultimately from a philosophical perspective we understand that values or you could say individual values need to be linked with universal or objective values so, so what i value should ultimately be linked with what is of actual value and the ultimate value is krishna param hamsa param hamsa means what one who sees the milk in the water and can seek the milk beyond the water so they can see what is of value so you could say param hamsa is the person who has the highest values who knows what to seek is of the ultimate value so that's why uh, <clears throat> the word values means uh, that different people may have different values and even people in satvaguna rajoguna tamaguna may have different values the important thing is not that we reject or immediately accept we uncritically accept or indiscriminately reject the diversity of values we try to see how these values are linked or are linking people with that which is of ultimate value or that which is of higher greater value in life so based on that the values need to be analyzed okay thank you yes, hi krishna thank you very much um i just wanted to comment on the, the how we implement the values in human society because it seems that uh the values change in society you know be formally people got very upset when they required seat belts you you gave a pretty extreme example of the car implementing the warning system but seat belts are pretty practical and uh smoking not smoking in public areas these are rules that are common sense but uh mm -hmm. you know now nowadays uh people are you know when they got rid of seat belts they said oh this is restricting our freedom but rules are necessary in certain circumstances are they not and also they can become entrenched uh like i don't know if you've ever heard this uh proverb that there was a guru who tied up his cat before he spoke and then when the guru died they kept on tying up the cat to the tree okay. and they kept on doing that i don't know have you ever heard that proverb yeah the point is that this is where if rules are followed blindly they can become superstitions also 
just something which we follow blindly. So there, there is definitely rules are required. Uh, oh, the point I was making is not that rules are not required. My point was that rules alone are not enough. If along with rules, values are not imparted, then the rules will either become repressive, will become exploitative for those who are imposing the rules or those on whom the rules are imposed, they will become, they will become rebellious. So yeah, we cannot, the, as you, yes, seed, as you get said, seed belts is an important example of how something which is simple, which can be done and which doing it is helpful. So there are many, you could say, uh, common sense rules, which can help people in functioning better. And overall, when rules are, it, there, there, see, there has to be an implementation of rules, but there has to be also an education about the importance of following rules. Otherwise, if it's only a fear-based or a punitive-based imposition, it becomes very difficult to sustain over a long period of time. So that's why education is important. That's the point I was making. At least a significant minority of, or a, a significant portion of people need to understand the rationale for the rules and voluntarily accept it. There'll be some who will do the right thing without the rules. There is some who will not do the right thing in spite of the rules. But for a majority of people, we need the rules and the rationale for the rules. That's when it will be followed. Otherwise, I think they are. Yeah. So the bottom line is without Krishna consciousness, without the values of Krishna consciousness guided by higher authority, then we're all lost. We're like a ship at sea without any rudder and we'll end up on the rocks. Doesn't matter yes. if you have rules or not. Correct? Yeah. Higher consciousness is required. At if Even if, if the world is not Krishna conscious, at least if some level of Sattva Guna is there, that is also helpful. Of course, Sattva Guna ultimately is not adequate, but you could say it's a hierarchy. And if everybody is in Tamaguna, then things are not going to work at all. If everybody is in Rajoguna, then some things will work but they will work only as long as, as long as uh, things, uh, worldly gratification is being provided for. Uh, so if there is Sattva Guna, then it's not only worldly gratification, but a little long-term perspective is there. And when there's Krishna consciousness, then there's the ultimate holistic vision is there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chitani Charan Prabhu. Would anyone else like to contribute a class? We have a lot of appreciations in the chat. Everybody's appreciating your answer. And uh, the, the subject was very, very, uh, I don't know, touchy, but you handled it expertly. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Beautiful. Happy to your service. I was thinking that the, the best way for us as devotees of Krishna, aspiring devotees of Krishna, to go beyond rules and regulations is to become pure at heart and uh, go beyond the rules, right? Yes, so purity means ultimately the highest value. See, in, the more impure we are, the more things which are not so valuable, we think consider them to be extremely valuable. If somebody has the impurity of pride, then how much I am respected in society becomes the most important thing. So like that, in general, when we say impurity, it can seem a little abstract. But generally, what is the impurity? Every impurity makes us value overvalue things which are not too valuable and conversely devalue that which is extremely valuable wow so purity purity means you could say our subjective values align most comp align align fully or aligned to a large extent with that which is of objective value so if you consider lust now ajamil he got so captivated by lust that because of that leave alone valuing Krishna, he didn't value his own family. He didn't value his parents. He didn't value his wife. He just rejected everything for going after a woman whom he had seen. What a guy. So, basic, so purity essentially means our subjective values become aligned with that which is of objectively the ultimate value. Thank you. Yes. Tantra Shrimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, scientist Ki Jai. Jai. Hare Krishna.